President Atsari, thank you very much for granting us opportunity to be in your office today. Welcome to Finland. To start with, it is <coughs> widely believed that uh, family background shapes people leadership aspirations and determination. To what extent has your family background shaped your leadership aspirations and skills? Perhaps even more, it has, it has had an influence on my character. My parents were very good human beings, both of them. They were religious, my father particularly. And I think they taught me how to treat other human beings and how to live even in marriage. It's, it's a very tough example they keep because they never quarreled. I, I remember only once my, my parents did quarrel. So it couldn't have been a better. I joined the YMC in Oulu, actually already in Kuopio, in their sports activities. And that had a very healthy impact on. According to my friends then, they said that I was always the one who, who started mediating all problems in a team when after the games there was a bit of a quarreling starting and I said, come on now. Perhaps that was the beginning of my, my mediation task. You then became the president of Finland as the 10th mm -hmm. president in the year 1994. Uh, what was your vision during your term as the president of Finland? Uh, there was a interesting time in UN, to me, which was perhaps one of the most important periods in my life when I worked from 77 to 1990 to get help Namibia becoming independent. And worked with many good African friends who helped me tremendously in that process, both inside UN and outside. But then I came back, after that came back home and, and became state secretary, I was still a civil servant. And then my name started appearing in, in, in sort of speculations that why not him, he has an international career. And when I looked at Finland at the time, I realized that in, in the early 90s, because we had lost our Soviet trade, because the change was taking place in the Soviet Union, we had very high unemployment. Finland was considering whether to join the EU and, and EMU, Eurozone. So I thought that, why not? It's six years, it's a long term. But I, I could do my utmost to improve the employment situation, which is not traditionally president's task. But I decided that I had to do something on that also help Finland to come out of the Cold War era, to become a normal Western democracy with, which honors responsible market economy, like all the Nordic countries do. And I, after, if I look back, I'm rather pleased about what I achieved. And I traveled with the Finnish industry throughout the world, promoting Finnish exports which was something that had not been done to that extent before and not thereafter. But I had the, I had the working man's life and possibilities in mind, because if we could flourish in our exports, we could also provide work for the Finns. Do you think uh, your vision at the time you assumed the president office was uh, clearly understood by your people? And, I, uh, I don't think it, it necessarily was. I sometimes had a rather rough time uh, from, from the population and from media. Partly also because I was not part of the political class. I was a civil servant. I was sort of odd man. They had been used to having politicians as president and of course some of them had stayed extremely long, like, like President Kekkonen. My predecessor had been there for two six-year terms. Uh, so it, it wasn't an easy way at all. Uh, and and, uh, and I un have, have a certain sympathy with them because I came from nowhere. People were 
I think, rather tired about traditional politicians at the time. And, and I had a very successful international career. And that perhaps explained why I was chosen. And what leadership lesson did you learn in bringing your vision to full fruition? First of all, I, being a politician should not be a lifelong end, enterprise. I wish we who become politicians had been doing something else in our life. That we have a professional career. And also, I think that we have a chance to return back to that mm. professional life. Why I say this is that then we are not so much keen in continuing our stay. In my country, it's limited to, to, uh, to two, two, terms. two terms. But I felt that one, one term was good for me because I knew that I could return hmm. to, to international uh, uh, civil servants' life. Hmm. Or I could go back to my... my uh, post in, in the foreign office. Now that might have been difficult, but international life, yes, mm -hmm. as I did. So I always had an alternative, which politicians very seldom have. You, Your Excellency, do you think you were too optimistic when you assumed the presidents on what you could possibly achieve <laughs> under circumstances? I think it's good to be optimistic, whether because I think you have all it's like a high jump that you have to try to put the rim as high as possible and try to jump over that. Because we succeeded in, we had, when I started in 94, we had roughly 450,000 unemployed. I put a working group together with the help of my friends, which was then adopted by the city government and particularly the government thereafter, after elections. And my target was to get the unemployment down to 200,000. When I left, we had 200, still 250,000 people unemployed. Partly because government had paid its state debt faster than we had anticipated. Good and well. We were in EU. We are a responsible member of the European Union. In, so then the question is, what is there for me to do anymore? I had done what I, I, I thought I, I should do, and I had been in international life for such a long time. And I knew that my friend Kofi Annan was Secretary General, and I knew that he would ask me to do something, which he did. So was that the reason why you did not run for the second term? That you thought there's a lot you could do at the international arena? Yes. Okay. Because uh, I had been on international arena before I, I came president. Mm -hmm. So it was a rather unusual uh, background. When I was campaigning, one farmer in, in the western part of Finland, when I was campaigning there, said that you are not even a Finn. You have lived so many years abroad. And I said to him that, look, I, I'm as much the Finn as you are, sit down. Mm. And he was a tall man, and I wasn't quite sure whether he would, but in the end he did. <laughs> <laughs> President Atisari, President Atisari, on your memoir, which you published in last year, you commented something like, luckily, I'm not a politician. H how would you explain that? No, it's, it's a perhaps unfortunate comment in many ways. Okay. Because I, I, I have great respect for politicians who take their job seriously. Like anybody else, I admire professionals. I have worked all my life with professionals. And, and when I, for instance, start a mediation, new mediation task, I pick up the best people I can lay my hands on. And I, now I have friends. If I would do something now internationally, I know whom I would ask. Most of them might say, yes, we want to come and work with you, because we have worked very well. So I admire whatever person's profession is, I always admire, whether you drive a car or, or you are a carpenter. Uh, it's as good as my work. President uh, Atisari, there are so many global pressing issues today. Forward. But, but can I, before you mm. move forward, can I still say that 
I've, I have always felt that I have more options than politicians. That's oh. why I think many politicians want to cling to power. Because of lack of options. Lack of options. When I went, for instance, to UN, I got leave of absence from my government. I could return. And I remember once in the 80s discussing with the Deputy Secretary General Peter, Dr. Peter, Peter Ornett, my Nigerian friend, who was the OAU Deputy Secretary General. I said, nothing is happening, I told Peter. I want to go home. I'm in the middle of my, my 40s and, and I'm losing. This is the best time in my life. He looked at me and said, and that showed what sort of friendship one had developed over the years. He said, Marty, you are not going anywhere. It's better to have a devil we know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I, I took that as a great compliment from a very good friend of mine. Because we had to discuss also very difficult issues, but we had created a relationship where we could always, in a friendly manner, argue and, and question, but we always listened to each other. So many global issues, as I said earlier on, that are very much pressing today. Mm -hmm. Poverty, HIV AIDS, mm. climate change, you, you yeah. name them. But after your presidency, you have taken a route onto conflict resolution mm -hmm. uh, and your institution, uh, CMI, is uh, adamantly advocating for crisis management uh, resolution. Yeah. Why did you opt that and you left other pressing issues? First of all, you can't do everything. I, I have a lot of sympathy with my colleagues who deal with the climate issues, for instance. Uh, development issues you have to understand. I tell my young colleagues that if you don't understand economics and development, you can't mediate peace either. Because it's very often issue of economics that is on, on the, the, one of the root causes of that. And of course, when I left the presidency, I formed the CMI to look at the whole gambit of how to prevent conflicts, how to try to mediate solutions to those and then how to make peace thereafter. Because that's, the peace agreement is only the beginning. Then you have to start improving the life of the people in, in your society. And that's a long, long process. And it's hopefully have decent elections that are honest and straightforward, not favoring anybody. But not only that, I'm more and more now uh, coming to the conclusion that if you look at our part of the world, the Nordic countries, how is it that we, we have an uh, uh, egalitarian societies in our part of the world, more than anywhere in the world? Why is it that Nordic countries, are, if you compare different countries in the world, we are doing so well in these comparisons? Excellent education, excellent health care, less crime than many other societies. Everyone has a chance in, 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 in a society. It's then up to you to take those chances. They, and utilize those chances. Yes. So you can't blame others. It's up to you. And perhaps we have to start mentioning that much more in our society. But I, I would argue that far too many cases, we come to a situation where when people come to power, they are more interested in enriching themselves, their relatives, than the population at large. We have enough examples. I don't want to start naming countries, and, and they are in every continent of the world, even Europe. So how do we get the, the governments and put pressure on governments to run more egalitarian policies? Because they are definitely good for those, even those who are wealthy in the society. So I think the Nordic countries have a particular responsibility, and I'm, I'm going to start pushing them, that we show our example, what we have achieved with this sort of policies, and say, come and have a look. This, this is a very workable solution. President Atisari, you were, you were once cited commenting that uh, you would love to return to Africa at one point. Mm -hmm. Why is this the case? No, I just came from Addis Ababa. 
<laughs> from the African Union meeting yeah, and, yeah. and sitting there in a brand new conference halls and admiring the new office facilities which the Chinese government had provided. And I met plenty of... Uh, I was actually assisting my, my, my government in, in its attempts to become the member of the Security Council for 2013 and 14. And I met many friends, including uh, uh, President Kikwete, unfortunately very briefly, but we had a chance to say hello. And, and, and I, I had a long meeting with, uh, uh, with Namibian president, who invited me to come there. And I have, we have known each other for such a long time. And it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to, to meet old friends. And I met so many others. Of course, they are, now the new generation is coming, those of your age, uh, that I don't anymore see so many old friends with whom I started in, 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 the, in the 60s. But uh, I'm now an honorary citizen of Namibia, so is my wife. Sometimes I, I tell the Finns that if you don't treat me well here, I will move to Namibia. <laughs> <laughs> but so far, I told President that so far they have treated me well enough that, that I, I haven't Just moved, but I want to come and visit you before your term, term ends. No, I, I love the con con continent and, and I'm very pleased that CMI, together with the South African, uh, NGO Accord, which is run by my friend Vasu Golden. They are working together with the African Union Secretariat, helping them to improve their uh, mediation capacity. And in, uh, we, are, we are now becoming even more concrete in, in trying to backstop some of the activities they are. Because the regional capacity is absolutely vital. We have to encourage. And look how, how my friend Kofi Annan uh, helped in Kenya, for instance. He has been in other countries as on his own, in his foundation, Kofi Annan Foundation, or as part of the elders. There's a feeling within the African Union that uh, Africa is... Uh, Marginalized, especially on, on matters which are Africa specific. The recent case of Libya, where African uh, Union solution, or rather proposition to the solution, was completely ignored by NATO and, and Western forces. Uh, what can African leaders learn from this? First of all, I, I, I wouldn't say that Africa is marginalized. On the contrary, it, it's because if there's something going wrong, the first I, I always say that th this is something that the Africans have to look at, first of all. And it is important that African Union and Organization of African Union, OAU earlier, for instance, they excluded those head of states who had come to power through coup d'etat. Yeah. I, I think that's a good, good sign. So now the desire to improve the capacity and increase the capacity, because they have extremely competent people who can as mediate. This is not the high science. This is something that normal human beings can do, what I have been doing, and my colleagues are doing now in, in, in different parts of the world. Helping people actually to get together and try to find a common, common ground. Perhaps if you look at the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, North Africa, these three countries that f are called the Arab Spring, Security Council did the, uh, another historic thing. They could make a decision, unanimous decision. There were a number of countries who abstained, uh, but, but uh, both permanent members and non-permanent but no one opposed it. They first time implemented the resolution of the, security, uh, of the General Assembly from 2005, responsibility to protect. 
which came from Canadian uh, Commission, which was led by two of my friends, uh, Kenneth Evans from Australia, former foreign minister, and, and uh, Mohamed Sanu, former assistant secretary general of OAU, and a good, both good friends of mine. General Assembly accepted that that international community has a secondary responsibility if the leaders in a country start misbehaving vis-a-vis -vis their citizens, as Gaddafi did in in case of Libya, and the other leaders as well. But it was the first time that Security Council could unite. We have seen now that it was not an easy decision, so many abstentions, but no one opposed it. But I could see that it would be much more difficult to get unanimity in, in the next case, which happens to be Syria. You have seen how complicated that is. But I think this decision to, to have established the no-fly zones was historic in many ways, because it sends, sent a message to, to any authoritarian leader in the world that if you misbehave, as these leaders had done, international community might come and, and do what it is authorized to do. So there was a Security Council decision where the African states also participated. President Atisari, political freedom has by and large achieved in Africa, but mm -hmm. freedom from hunger, from disease, is still a dream to many countries in Africa. Uh, what leadership response in your view is needed? And has African leadership produce the best to try to curb this? Look, that sort of, we can discuss of leadership in any country. We don't need to single out Africa. I, I think leadership leaves something to be desired in every, every society. And we have a critical look, and we should have a critical look at all of us who, who want to lead us. Uh, Af actually, there has been a in many African countries, a good economic growth. But now I would say that now we have to start looking all over the world how those who come to power, how they are utilizing their power. Are they prepared to run egalitarian policies that benefit everybody in a society? Or are they simply there to enrich themselves? And I, I think we should pay much more attention not only to the elections that they are good and democratic and fair. I have, I have supervised in Namibia the most democratic elections in the world. And I'm very proud that we managed to do that. But, but in many countries, elections are not fair. Then those who come to power don't run egalitarian policies. That's why I think my part of the world, the Nordic countries, have to be much more straightforward in saying, Come and see how our system functions. Because uh, you have to establish trust in, in any society so that people feel that they have a chance to develop their skills. Which leader in the world has influenced you most? And what did you learn from him or her? The first one, of course, which I, I, I was very lucky to learn was, was President Nyerere. Uh, he was honest. He was sincere. He taught me a lot. That, that was a man who was not looking for enriching himself. Later on, he also realized and had, had the guts actually to recognize that some of the economic policies like Ujama mm. were not perhaps the best. It was ideal, but it was not what the country perhaps needed. And when I was in his memorial service as, as a president and spoke there, I recognized that, that he was a great man in that sense as well. The one who has had the most impact on me by far is President Mandela. And you, you see <laughs> two paintings here, which are Mandela pres painting. Pres presents from him okay. to me and my wife. There's no other paintings here okay. except those two. That's the, the uh, picture behind me. Is from a meeting in South Africa with him as, as the elders group. Uh, 
the man, I'm, I'm still wondering how that sort of personality comes. He was kept in jail for 26 years, and I have visited his cell. And he has no bitterness to those who, who did this to him. I think it is important that people analyze that how this sort of personality is come. He is close, closest to a saint, I, I have very often said that, because I don't think that I could have, I very often ask myself, could I have behaved the same way as, as Mandela did? And I have my grave doubts. It's so easy to be born in my part of the world, where everything functions, where you can, everyone has a chance in a society. Whether you come from a poor or, or, or wealthier background. But he wanted to unite the nation. I think now it is for those who are in power and, and, and they have to look now that they start advancing more egalitarian policies in their society. Because otherwise in any society that is starting as they have done, when these first leaders disappear, then it's much more complicated to maintain the societal peace in the society if everyone doesn't realize that there has to be more egalitarian policies. Because poverty will not be reduced. We can talk in UN to the end of our days, but if those who come to power with the support of the international community because the financial assistance is also a technical assistance important, but nothing replaces that every leader must keep in mind not only his immediate family and, and friends, but the whole nation. In what ways has Nobel Prize affected your life and your leadership aspiration? No, it has, first of all, it has reminded me of my responsibility. If, if the committee decided it to give to me, it's, it's, I, I have to use my time and try to do my utmost. And that's that I'm doing at the moment. When the announcement was, was made on the 10th of October 2008 that I will get the prize, my office started re receiving, uh, and I have to warn those who want to have a Nobel Peace Prize, I, we started receiving 30 requests a day for my time that I should do this or that. Could I do this or that? Could I be there? And so on. Now my staff says that it has slowed down a bit, that we only receive 100 requests a week. But you understand that no human being can do 100 things. Therefore, you, I have to con try to concentrate on, on certain issues. That's why uh, I, I, I may be supportive when it comes to to AIDS programs or, 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 as you mentioned, the, the climate change and so on. Poverty is part of, uh, has always been, because my background is in the development work. And I'm very thankful that, that that was where I started, because it has helped me perhaps more than anything else to understand. I sti I'm still asking myself, how can we get the development going in the poorest segments of, of our societies. President Atisari, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And Good to see you here. Thank you. <laughs>